and visited local authority short-stay hostels. Now, the DHSS says that while the allowance can continue being drawn for four weeks after a child goes into an NHS facility, if it's a local authority hostel established just to give parents a few days' break, then the allowance stops immediately. 64 families in Barnsley have had their allowance books withdrawn on these grounds, and at Maidenhead in Berkshire, the insurance officer has demanded £727 back from the parents of 15-year-old Andrea Neville because he's not satisfied that they, quote, have throughout used due care and diligence to avoid overpayment. Andrea's mother, Beryl, a part-time teacher, told me her reaction when two investigators appeared on her doorstep last January and told her she owed them more than £700. My reaction was one of, of shock and horror, uh, and I shook, uh, and I felt I was being accused there on the spot. You hadn't ever considered the fact that uh, when your daughter was in a form of care, she shouldn't be receiving attendance allowance? No, not at all. And I'd obviously talked it over with friends in a similar situation with children having short-term care in hostel and hospital. Uh, and, and they were claiming the money the same as I was. But Mr Neville, the DHSS says that the rules are very clear, that you shouldn't have been receiving the attendance allowance in these circumstances, and that you didn't act with due care and diligence in trying to avoid overpayment. I, we acted uh, according to our understanding of the rules, and we asked other people, including Berkshire Social Services, whether we should. And Berkshire Social Services obviously thought that we should be receiving the money. So they weren't acting with due care and diligence either? Well, if you say so. Um, they obviously thought so because they imposed a special charge on parents receiving the money whose children were going to Larchwood and only to those parents. It sounds as though that you feel that the, the rules were nowhere near as clear as the DHSS suggests they were. No, they're not clear at all. How far are you prepared to fight this, Mrs. Miller? We have the tribunal ahead of us uh, and who knows you know, what will happen then, but that, that is the next stage and we're, we're taking advice from National Society um, and, and social services to get the best advice we can in the, in the situation. Yeah, it's not so much us paying, it's the other people who uh, who send children to Larchwood. Um, we are probably better able to pay um, than a lot of the parents, and we know single parent families, families where the husband is out of work with children going there. I mean, how can they afford to live? To repay his money. I don't think it was the original intention of the Act that the money should be taken away from you uh, if you send your child away from home. Um, I thought the money was there for you to be able to pay for care for the child and it seems to me ludicrous that if you send the child away from home that uh, they can consider that you're not spending the money in the correct manner and that you should have it taken away from you. Well, James Ross of Mencap, why do you think this clampdown or apparent clampdown has occurred now? Well, I think it's come to the uh, notice because there are more places in the community for short-term care than there used to be, and this is increasing. And it's obviously being drawn to the public attention. So it is this differentiation between local authority care and hospital care? Right. The, the, the question that if a child goes into a hospital for short-term care, the attendance allowance continues for four weeks and there's no question of parents making uh, any contribution. If the child goes into local authority care, the attendance allowance stops immediately and most local authorities charge the parents for that care. Can you see any justification for such a difference? No, it, it's absolute nonsense and uh, as the regulations must be changed. The regulations the are quite clear though on this. Oh yes, the regulations at present are quite clear but they're inconsistent and unreasonable. But doesn't that mean that when you attend the appeals tribunal on behalf of the Nevilles you won't really be holding out too much hope about their case? Oh yes, we, yes we will because the parents in this particular case, as they, they have been in many others have been completely misled by the social services department who wrote to the parents saying that in future they will be making a charge for short-term care for children in the local authority provision but the charge uh, is intended to apply only to those children whose parents receive the attendance allowance. Not a happy tale that one. I'm afraid our next story is hardly any better. Three months back, you may recall, we reported on the pioneering work being conducted in a handful of clinics around Britain to try to help the literally millions of people who suffer from tinnitus, noises in the head. 
We said that the use of the relatively new tinnitus maskers there had achieved wonders for many people whose lives are made almost unbearable by these non-stop bangs, rattles or whistles. But now, one of those few clinics, the one based at London's University College Hospital, is threatened with imminent closure. Kevin Mulhern reports. The UCH Tinnitus Clinic, which is run by Dr. Jonathan Hazel, has treated nearly a thousand sufferers since it started work in 1977. Presently, new patients have to wait up to two years for their first appointment. Yet, unless the government finds £40,000 within the next few days, it will close. No new patients will ever be seen, and those patients that have appointments will have them cancelled. People like David Reddington. I was lucky, really, because I think I was one of the few people that got to the clinic fairly quickly. Lots of people have got histories of uh, being shunted around their GPs for, for years and years before they got there. But within three or four years of discovering the tinnitus, I was being seen by Dr. Hazel. Um, and receiving all the benefits that the, the clinic can give. Can you describe for me what your tinnitus is like? Absolutely awful. It's like listening to uh, somebody shaking a tambourine at the same time as uh, listening to a, a hissing as a steam were being emitted from a, a, a kettle or a, an air pipe. There's whistles and shrieks and tones and it's constant, um, although it varies slightly in volume from day to day or afternoon to morning. It, it is there 24 hours a day and it's a constant fight. And the clinic have helped him fight so much so that he is still in work and is now fitted with tinnitus maskers and hearing aids. The reason why the money has run out for the clinic is because for the last three years it has been funded by a direct grant from central government. Now that grant was made for research, not to help patients directly. Now, say the government, the research is over, and if the clinic is to continue its work, it must be funded by the local district health authority. But, says Pamela Kennedy of the British Tinnitus Association, that isn't on. If there were clinics throughout the United Kingdom which were satisfactorily treating people who have tinnitus, then we'd go along with the um, premise that um, the area health authorities should be funding the clinics. But such clinics just do not exist. There are so few people who are taking an interest in tinnitus that people are inevitably drawn to a centre where they know they will get sympathetic treatment. In this case, the authority concerned is the Bloomsbury District Health Authority. Now, what they argue is they haven't got the money this year to help the clinic continue. They have local commitments which they have to fulfil. They say, in any case, this clinic has now become a national resource centre for people suffering with tinnitus. Pamela Kennedy points out that there are only 11 specialists in Britain dealing with tinnitus and there could be as many as 8 million people suffering with the condition. I put it to Pamela Kennedy, did she think the government had lost sight of clinical care for tinnitus sufferers? It isn't that they've lost sight of patient care. At the moment, they have yet to provide any funds for clinical management of tinnitus. The only money they have provided at a government level has been for the three-year research project. So they've really uh, hardly started to take an interest in clinical management. Now, it did look as if this whole question had died the death just before the election. But on the 2nd of June, that was in the midst of the election campaign, a minister at the DHSS, Lord Trafgon, wrote to the RNID, the Royal National Institute for the Deaf, and said that he thought the problems about funding the clinic were intractable, but he thought it all could be given further thought after the election. Many people were surprised. But so far, the DHSS and the Bloomsbury District Health Authority haven't come up with a compromise. They won't, in fact, even give statements at the moment, saying that they're not sure whether, in fact, the clinic can be kept open. The whole situation is very unsatisfactory and is causing considerable distress to patients like David Reddington. My involvement with the clinic now is, is merely a question of uh, my perhaps attending once a year to have my hearing tested to check that it hasn't deteriorated uh, and for me to keep the clinic informed as to how I'm coping with the tinnitus. My lifeline in a way, even though I've said that they're not able to or haven't been able to, to do anything to make life as bearable as I would like it, they're the only place that when things get really bad I can phone up and say look I'd like to come in and see uh, Dr. Hazel or, or his assistant Sue Wood um, or to ask advice about uh, fault with um, a masker or a hearing aid uh, or even when things just get so desperate that I'm feeling almost suicidal and I can say look can I come along and see you it's somebody to turn to 
The DHSS this week told us that they're still considering the case for granting the clinic more funds. As soon as we hear their final decision, we'll pass it on. Now, I'm sure you saw the incredible story this week of the farm worker whose arm was ripped off in a baler and who picked it up and walked a mile to the nearest farmhouse. One newspaper called Roy Tapping, the bravest man in Britain, and no wonder. But I wonder how many of you found your minds being drawn inexorably to another name, Douglas Bader. I did, but then I've just been reading a new biography of the flying ace who captured the nation's imagination in similar fashion 40 years ago. In the year that's passed since his death, a memorial trust has been set up in his name to assist amputees and thereby carry on the work to which Bader gave so much of his time after the war. Unfortunately, I didn't feel the new book devoted enough time to any of his ground-based interests, but to rectify that fault, at least in the area of disability, that was the sole subject on which I talked with the author Robert Jackson. But before I did, we listened to a 30-year-old recording of Bader himself talking about a typical encounter with an amputee. As it happens, an American soldier in a New York hospital who was exercising on parallel bars until Bader came along. And I walked up to this chap who looked a pretty tough specimen. And I said quite deliberately, uh, why don't you come out from behind those bars? And he looked at me and he said, say, he said, who the hell are you? And I said, well, matter, I'm an Englishman, but I just happened to be passing through. And I've got... Uh, both my legs off. In fact, rather worse than you because I've got only one knee. I see you've got both your knees. He said, well, let's see your walk. So I turned around and walked up the gymnasium and back again. And uh, he said, well, Harry, he said, let's see. So I pulled my trousers up and showed him. And he said, well, Hal, he said, let me out of here. <laughs> and that fellow came straight out of there. He parallel bars. And I took over him one side. And the, the, um, <clears throat> the gym instructor, whatever that I was, took over the other side. And by the time... We'd finished. It was only about 20 minutes. And that fellow uh, was really going to town on his days. He reckoned that it was nothing at all. Well, Bob Jackson, for giving Bart his awful American accent there, that does seem to epitomize the way that he inspired hundreds, maybe thousands of amputees, doesn't it? Yes, it does indeed. But he did tend to bully at times. Uh, well, I think that uh, he, he was ruthless with himself, I think, in overcoming his own uh, disability. And therefore, it tended to be ruthless with other people, and it certainly produced uh, results. He'd go out of his way, though, particularly for children, wouldn't he? Oh, yes, he would. Yes. Uh, I remember one classic incident with um, a small lad called Richard Griffiths from Minehead in Somerset, where um, this boy had lost his legs in a tractor accident, his right leg in a tractor accident. And uh, Douglas Bader wrote him a letter, uh, which I'll quote. It said, Dear Richard... Many years ago, I lost both my legs, so I can imagine you're feeling a bit disturbed at the sudden loss of, loss of a leg. Although things seem pretty dreary at the moment, you'll find that they'll get better as you begin to move around and get back to normal. The great thing in life is not to worry about something you can't change. I love that phrase, pretty dreary. Yes, yeah, that was quite uh, a well, bad sort of expression. He didn't achieve everything he set out to do, though. I mean, there was the celebrated case of Jimmy Martin, wasn't there? Yes, uh, he had a long crusade for Jimmy Martin to try and get... Uh, uh, benefits for the boy's mother um, through Parliament. This and was a little boy, aged not, eight, wasn't he? Wasn't yes, he was, yeah. But he, he'd lost an arm as well as a leg, this this, this little boy. And, and uh, Douglas Bader fought consistently for a long time, um, writing letters and visiting uh, the House of Commons personally and so on. Uh, but I don't think it ever produced any uh, any result. And Of course, he was, it has to be admitted, a very difficult man. And there was one occasion when he even got into trouble with his own fellow amputees. Yes, that was... Uh, <laughs> Douglas Bader was, he was a great patriot, you see, and everything British was, was good. And uh, he made this statement about the limbs which are fitted to um, ex-servicemen and so on, limbless ex-servicemen, and the British is best. And this produced a strong reaction from the uh, Limbless Ex-Servicemen's Association, who uh, said, well, it isn't the best, and they sent him bits and pieces of various artificial limbs to prove that that wasn't so. But you don't think they were acting totally fairly? No, I don't think so. I, I uh, Certainly, Bader had always used British limbs, and... Uh, he, uh, he found no fault with them. I, I think perhaps, obviously, there are the odd cases where things go wrong, and I think it was unfairly seized upon and reported out of all proportion at the time. I suppose it seems a strange question to ask about a man who was knighted for his work for disabled people, but could he have done more? I mean, he was a marvellous organiser. Couldn't he have actually set up an organisation 
Um, there is one now which exists as a m memorial to him, but couldn't he have set one up during his lifetime so that everything could be channeled into that one organization rather than the sort of haphazard visits which he made to individual amputees? Well, I'm quite sure he could, but you see, Douglas Bader's problem was that he was such a uh, fountain of boundless energy that he was, he was involved in so many things at the same time. And I think to do that, he would have had to renounce a lot of other things he was deeply involved in. I mean, for, for one thing, he had lots of crusades going. Um, he was uh, very keen on anti-vivisection, for example, and uh, he was uh, felt very strongly against anyone who was cruel to animals in any way. So all these little crusades added up to a lot of organization within his life. But how much of a debt of thanks do you think disabled people generally owe to Douglas Byrne? I think a great one, because he, he showed that guts and determination can overcome a lot. Um, he showed people that uh, it's, no, it's no use giving in, it's no use feeling sorry for yourself. So Bada's philosophy was always never look back. There's always a, a big life ahead of you, no matter what's happened to you. Sir Douglas Bada, a biography by Robert Jackson, is published by Arthur Barker at £8.50. And so we come to that bargain I mentioned at the outset, an off-season Spanish holiday for disabled holidaymakers for as little as £55 a week. Mind you, for that you must be in a group of four and stay for three months. But you have to stay for one month at least if you decide to take an apartment at Calpe on the Costa Blanca with the specialist firm for disabled tourists out and about. Marlene Pease asked their spokesman, Tony Presky, why they'd chosen this particular resort. Well, Calpe is one of these small towns about 15 miles north of Benidorm. It's a very quiet town. Um, it's an ideal place for people. A lot of business people go there in the winter. And it's got a very long, flat promenade, um, so that's ideal. Calpe itself is um, reasonably hilly, but the area we choose is, is fairly flat. Where's the nearest airport? The nearest airport is Alicante. And that's where your holidays fly to, is it? That's right, yes. They're met by one of our holiday hostesses and driven straight to their apartment. Now let's get to the flats themselves. Are they all easily accessible and on the ground floor? Yes, they are. They're very easily accessible. Um, take our one-bedroom apartments. They have um, a bedroom, a lounge, a kitchen, um, a well-equipped bathroom, and also a sun area. It could be a patio or it could be a balcony. Uh, but it's a nice, spacious apartment. What else does the, the package include? We're offering a complete use um, of, of a car while, while you're over there. Our hostesses are always on hand to take you around to various places. Um, so if you need to use them any time, please, you know, it's all you have to do is give them a call. And they will take you, they will help you plan your trips and, and this sort of thing. And what about cleaning and, and linen and things like that? That's all taken care of. That's all inclusive in, in, in the price. Your hostesses are going out for periods of a month at a time, aren't they? Yes, they are. Well, have you got enough then to, to cope with the six-month winter season? We have some, but we're always looking for more. If, if people are interested, then we'd be, be happy to hear from them. Well, what are you offering then? We're offering people return airfares, um, at the use of a two-bedroom apartment, all the gas, electricity, heating, lighting is all free, um, and also there's the use of a car or a minibus, and also we'll, we'll pay them £400 per month between them to look after our clients. Now, what are they expected to do in return for that? In return for that, we'd like them to basically um, look after our clients at all times. They are really at their beck and call throughout the holiday. Um, we need them to have a sympathetic ear sometimes. We need them to be able to entertain them in the evenings. If they simply want to sit and have a drink and play cards, then we expect them to do that. We expect them to, to do, do a meet and greet service at, at the airport, so that as soon as people arrive at the airport, then they're instantly on holiday and they know that our people are caring for them. Generally, just look after the guests throughout the whole month, and if they have any problems, then sort them out. And what about shopping? Because, you know, I know Calpe, it isn't that flat. No, well, we, we ask people, um, usually people want to go shopping a couple of times a week. So our hostesses will drive them to the shop, show them around the shops, bring them back home again. Finally, what about the flights out from the UK? Is it just from one airport in particular? No, it's not. No, we, we've, we can fly from virtually any airport within the UK. Um, all the provincial airports, the two main ones, and whichever airport is closest to the, the customer's home, then we'll get a flight from, from there. Are you confident that the airlines carrying your disabled passengers out are going to treat them well? Yes, we are confident. We um, always use... Um, the recognized airlines, we, we use charter flights, and we make sure that our people are taken care of. So that uh, the people at the airport and the airline know what to expect? Yes, they do. We always inform them. We don't just turn up on spec. <laughs> and those off-season trips are organized by Out and About between the 29th of October and the 29th of April.
Finally, the most creative item of the entire program. Last Tuesday, the students of Fairfield School for Disabled Youngsters in Northampton gave everyone, including themselves, a treat by holding a public reading of extracts from their new book. It's the culmination of a series of visits by Northampton's writer-in-residence, Nigel Gray, who the day afterwards came into our Northampton studio with some of the older children to give me a taste of what I'd missed. The town. The town is big. It was cruffy and carelessly looked after. Rubbish here, rubbish there. They don't seem to care about their town. Drinks, broken bottles, broken toys. It's everywhere, but I don't care. They throw things out of the window for all they care. Well, Nigel Gray, there's an example of the sort of thing that you've uh, been able to get from the children. Now, what do you think that you were able to contribute as a professional writer that a teacher of English at the school wasn't able to do? I think, um, you know, being a new face and reading my own stories and poems to them, there's always something, I think, a bit special if somebody's reading things that they wrote themselves as opposed to teachers usually reading things that somebody else has written that they like. Yes, but presumably uh, you get the same sort of response whether you're in an ordinary school or a special school. Yes, from the children in, in their... Um, or, uh, probably within the writing, you often get um, perhaps different elements in the writing that you wouldn't get, obviously. Such as? Well, um, when children are writing about their own experiences, um, I mean, a lot of the children have had uh, sad, upsetting, moving experiences, and of course mm. that finds its way either directly into the writing when they're writing autobiographically, or mm. it often comes out if they're writing imaginatively, you know, like horror stories or something, or the, the fears and so on that have been created by their lives find their way in, and you get some quite uh, surprising and unusual elements in the writing. But in terms of relating to the children, it's... it's um, uh, exactly the same sort of experience. So you didn't feel that there was an added dimension except in so far as the their different experiences were concerned? Except um, the culmination of the project was a public performance and I, I certainly felt there was an extra dimension in that and I, I don't know why but perhaps because these children who are uh, less uh, used to being able to perform, you know, to stand up in front of an audience and do something a bit special and have the audience respond in an enthusiastic and appreciative way to them. And uh, certainly a feeling of uh, great enjoyment or even thrill from some of the children conveyed itself to me and I was uh, able to share in that and, and uh, privileged really in the sharing that uh, thrill. And they must be pretty chuffed about having all their works published in a book. I should think so, yes. I haven't seen them today, but uh, last night uh, I, it was the first time we saw, we saw the books, and uh, I would imagine uh, they're all pretty pleased about that. I noticed that everyone was becoming concerned about Nigel's health. He sat in his wheelchair, doubled up with a pain that was much worse than usual, and moaning, everyone telling him that he must eat. When Nigel died, everyone was upset especially those who knew him well. I felt pretty helpless seeing everyone in grief. We were going out that day and everyone went in the minibuses with their eyes red and tear-stained, laying their heads down on the seat in front to rest. We journeyed in almost complete silence, except for the sobs of David, a lad of 16 who had been Nigel's helper. He was sitting at the back listening to his mini cassette recorder through headphones. He must have felt that his world of music gave him some privacy. Cara, that was very interesting. Obviously, the experience of Nigel dying was very moving for you. Yes. But when you came to, to write it down, was it a great help to have Nigel Gray assisting you in writing it? Yes, because I wanted to write it, write it down as to start off with as a personal thing to keep. But then when Nigel came, I thought, well, why not let everyone hear it, you know? Yes, and put it in the book like that? Yeah. What's it like to be in print? Very good. <laughs> are you going to write, are you going to do anything else? Yes. I'm, I'm going to do uh, my Duke of Edinburgh award, and Nigel's going to help me. Oh, what are you going to do for that? Um, you have to do writing for a skill, but you can choose lots of other subjects as well, so I chose writing. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you very much. 
Well, let me talk to one of the teachers, Leslie Roberts. Um, Leslie, what do you think this assignment has done for the children? Well, I think it's given them a stimulation to write that they wouldn't otherwise have had. Um, because all these young people are disabled, they don't have the same access to the arts, perhaps, as able-bodied children would. It's more difficult for them to go to the theatre, say, or the cinema, or even to the public library. Did it surprise you, the amount of imagination that their writing showed up? It did, actually, yes. We were all very amazed at um, the work the children produced. Now you've got to keep it on, though. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've certainly got something to live up to. Liverpool are going to play Juventus for the European Cup. I had got two tickets to go to Munich. Sitting next to me on the plane was Suzanne Larsmo. She is Swiss. She said she was going to present the trophy to the winning team. I asked her why she had been chosen. She said in a sweet, soft voice, I would have been Queen of Switzerland if the Swiss had not voted for a president. I loved her. She was beautiful and so simple and not very posh. We eventually got in the ground after 12 hours of queuing in the freezing cold, but it was worth it. And Susan and the West Germans had kept my spirits up. And you'll be pleased to know that Liverpool won 6 0. My special thanks there to Cara, Sharon, Stuart, Gary, and Gavin for reading the extracts.